Hi, my name is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics, where we grow cool plants. And today's lesson is all about air layering. And air layering is a way of propagating, cloning genetically identical plants to the parent plant where there might be some characteristics about the plant that you're trying to get more of, whether it be the taste of the fruit, the quality of the fruit, the consistent yields of the fruit, the way the tree grows, the height of the plant, um, and so many other characteristics that may be um, something you're trying to get from that parent plant and then duplicate it, otherwise known as cloning the plant. And it's typically done for easier plants by way of cutting. And one of these trees that's really easy and it's been done since BC times is fig trees, which I'm gonna give you a tour of in just a second. This fig behind me is the 10 in one fig tree. And again, I'm gonna go into detail and share all the different flavors and colors that are all on just one tree by way of grafting, but I'm gonna to get to that in just a second. But the reason for air layering is sometimes cuttings don't work so easy. Easy examples of propagating by way of cutting would be stuff such as sugarcane, geraniums, um, figs, as we just said, grapes, roses, citrus, among many, many other plants that are just really easy to propagate by way of cutting. But for those that are harder to accomplish success by way of cutting, air layering is the way to do it. Some plants that are hard to propagate by way of cutting, at least in my opinion, would be um, plants such as um, those in the Prunus genus, um, plants that would be like peaches, plums, apricots, and almonds and cherries. Those are all Prunus genus type plants. Um, other ones that are also, in my opinion, harder to propagate by way of cutting would also be like apples and avocados. And again, there's many, many other types of trees that, you know, you can't just take a cutting off of it and stick it in the ground and achieve high success rates. And that's when air layering comes in because by way of air layering, you can have success rates that are very close to 100%. And I'm proud to share with you that I did a lesson on this about four years ago that has well exceeded over a million views. And I'm gonna share with you just some of the highlights from that lesson, but more importantly, and some one of the most often asked question I get from that lesson is when is the best time to air layer my plants? And that I'm giving to you right here and right now is to do it during the growing season. And here we are now in September, and I wish I did this lesson for you guys back in spring as a reminder, but spring, summer, and early fall are the best times to air layer your plants, especially those that aren't dormant, such as, again, your peaches, plums, apricots, and apples, and so forth, um, that go into dormancy over the winter. If you're really adamant about trying air layering through the winter, you'll have better success on your evergreens, whether it be a pine tree, or your citrus or your roses. Um, for some parts of the country where it's warmer, um, the roses are still active during the winter. Um, you may achieve some success during the winter months, but it'll just take a little bit longer than the fastest success rate you'll get come spring, summer, and early fall. Before we get started on the air layering lesson, there's a tree that was completely neglected this entire growing season um, in the sense of not being shared often enough um, with you viewers. And that's why I'm sitting here now in front of the 10 in one. I just had to share the last few fruit that are left on here just to show how much fun you can have. And this was my hook into gardening as a child is grafting. And um, for those of you that haven't tried it, I highly recommend it. I'll give you the link um, to some of the grafting lessons where we grafted this fig by way of two ways. One is the approach grafting technique, which is my favorite way of grafting. And then the other one is by the cleft grafting technique and I'll highlight those as well um, behind me and I'll show you the full link on how we accomplished that in great detail. And so the figs that I've grafted onto this tree are the following varieties, which I've now got written out, is the tiger, also known as the panache fig, raspberry latte fig, cadota fig, brown turkey fig, the boar josette noir, the Saint Rita fig, the celestial fig, the Chicago hardy fig, the green isha fig, and the strawberry latte fig. So, um, and I just want to thank Richard Bertram, who's contributed um, to some of the varieties behind me. Um, Kevin Chang of Bear Root Nation has contributed some of the varieties behind me. Um, R Jeffrey Upton in Tustin, California has contributed some of the varieties behind me. Joseph Yakira in San Diego of Man vs. Fruit. 
um, Facebook group who's contributed some of the varieties behind me. Um, and that just leads me to another point I wanna share with you is that every single year, Ivory Organics for three consecutive years has been giving away big cuttings in the month of February. And the announcement always goes up on February 1st and runs during the entire month. And 2020, we gave away between three to 400 cuttings. And for the fig cutting giveaway 4.0, which is expected to take place on February 1st of 2021, we're anticipating cuttings um, in the numbers of close to a thousand. So um, we're hoping to meet everybody's um, demands across the country and, and just excited to share all of these varieties, which again came from the um, most generous annual contributors have been Edgar Valdivia of the California Rare Fruit Growers. He's um, one of the board members and also has a YouTube channel where he talks a lot about growing dragon fruit. He's one of the experts in the field. And then there's Paul Talley, also a California Rare Fruit Grower member. Jeffrey Upton in Tustin. And any of you that would also be interested in, um, if you're especially in the Southern California area and I can come and visit, I'd be happy to um, collect as we're gonna be needing a lot of cuttings for the annual fig cutting giveaway 4.0. Now let's check out these varieties. Just over here to my left is the panache tiger. And it's called the tiger because you can see the striped figs right here. This one over here is just about ripe. Um, but we're gonna leave it for another day. If we look up a little above it, you can see another color fig. This one here is called the raspberry latte fig. And let me split that for you. This here again is the raspberry latte fig. The darker figs are typically more of a berry flavor fig, whereas the green ones are typically more of a honey flavor. Keep in mind, there's hundreds, if not thousands of varieties of figs, and sure there's exceptions to the rule, but generally again, green ones more on the honey flavor, the darker ones, the browns and the blacks, um, and this one over here being more of a purple type fig um, is more of a berry flavor. So this one here again, the raspberry latte, fantastic so over here boar josette noir you can see it's more of like a brown purple and then behind it the common kadota green fig and then just right over that over here over on my left shoulder is the brown turkey figs and now let's come around the tree another one of my favorites and again this here was done by way of the cleft graft right here this here is the strawberry vert fig and you can see the figs if we follow up right there these are the last few of the strawberry verts if we follow this one this one here was done by way of the approach graph and they get another strawberry vert with the last few figs you can see something already got to it um there's been birds all over this tree so it's kind of a competition between me and the birds typically i can put a net over the entire fig for the month when the fruit are ripening to best protect it as we go in over here is the celestial variety just in front of it over here is the chicago hardy variety um and then behind it you can see there's another black variety of fig and then the evidence of the birds just check out all these leaves with all the fruit droppings everywhere over here we can see it's been painted with the iv organic three-in-one plant guard protection against damaging sunburn insects and rodents for use on your roses fruit nut trees ornamental trees and shrubs and um, healthier than latex paint and tar based products as the product dries on porously and it's also organic it's omri registered and listed for organic use compared to using paint which will eventually slough off the plant over the course of a year or two this product when it enters your soil is an organic alternative to having paint that's gonna be stuck in your soil indefinitely. So we basically protected the grafting wound, which again, we did by way of the approach graft. This here is the celestial um, variety of fig. And we grafted it onto my grandfather's rootstock um, fig that he had growing on his properties for about the last 40 years. Um, we call it the Grandpa Saman. Um, rootstock and we've also got cuttings off of this plant growing in containers on other parts of the property. I know a lot of people also say that figs are parthenocarpic which they are meaning that they're um, the fruits are fertilized um, without requiring fertilization but as you can see here with this baby fig tree next to me 
Um, the bird droppings do carry some seeds that do get fertilized. And this here is most likely now a cross being a child, just like all of us from our parents are not genetically identical. This fig is now a new variety of fig, something that crossed with those 10 excellent variety of figs behind me. If we allow it to grow to fruit, there's a chance it might be something spectacular. Um, and also it may not be as again, it's a child and we don't know what type of characteristics it's gonna have in regards to flavor, size, annual fruit consistencies, and so on and so forth. And that's the importance for creating genetically identical plants that once it proves itself successful and consistent, you basically wanna create more genetically identical plants from that original parent plant. Planting a seed as this little sapling fig behind me is something that's random, just like our children. They're random variations. They might be related, they might be better, they might be worse, um, but they're different. They're not the same. So when you want identical plants, when you want to clone genetically identical more of that plant, then you're gonna do it by three ways, even though I've only mentioned two so far, actually I've said all three, it is by way of cutting, by way of air layering, and also by way of grafting. That's how you create genetically identical more plants identical to that parent plant that you want more of. Without any further ado, let's go to that September of 2016 air layering lesson. These are just highlights. I'll put the link where you can watch the entire lesson in full. Um, but these are my highlights from that lesson that has been viewed over a million times. Enjoy. Air layering is a method that's been used by farmers and orchard growers around the world for centuries. Air layering is a method of actually propagating plants and creating genetically identical clones of exactly that same plant. And today we're gonna to be um, showing how to do that. What I wanna share with you is, this here is my air layer, and I'm gonna show you exactly on how to do it. But this is gonna allow me to um, propagate and create a genetically identical Eureka lemon tree from its origin, which was actually originated here in Los Angeles, California. Um, back in 1858. So this Eureka lemon tree, which I planted only two years ago here in my garden and grafted on a semi-dwarf rootstock is these leaves and this plant that's actually above the rootstock is actually from 1858, making this plant 158 years old. So once we remove this plant from the parent plant, which is the bottom part, we'll have a brand new tree, but the wood is 158 years old. Within the first year, and for sure by the second year, once the roots get established, it can now support fruit, unlike growing a seedling. A seedling will have to take anywhere, um, growing a, a lemon seedling or any other citrus from seed can take anywhere from five to upwards of 10 years for it to actually bear fruit. This is a very fast way to actually create genetically identical fruit, so you know you're getting the superior quality, um, yield, and flavor that you're, that you're looking for. And that's why we've actually done, the, done this for our Eureka lemon tree. Let me give you some other examples of trees that can actually be propagated similarly. You can air layer a hibiscus. You can air layer an Oro Blanco grapefruit. You can air layer a Fuerte avocado tree. You can air layer an apple tree. You can even air layer vines such as passion fruit, as well as grapes can be air layered. But you cannot air layer a banana. It just won't work. You also can't air layer strawberries. Why would you? They propagate by runners. You can create genetically identical plants by these runners that are actually running off this potted strawberry. Let's get started. So the materials you need to get started for air layering are as follows. We're gonna need some scissors. I've also got some pruners. We're gonna need some twine, some string. I've also got some sphagnum moss, which is right here. And then I've also got some root, rooting powder. I've got this plastic empty bottle. I also brought a razor blade. And I got some tin foil. And I'm gonna show why, and if you don't have these materials, how you can easily substitute them for other stuff. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get started and I'm gonna show you how we're actually gonna accomplish this method using a fig tree. What I've got labeled here is a piece of paper that says auxin, which is the plant hormones that are generated typically by the leaves and the tips of the plant. The um, 
So the auxins are created by the, um, the shoots. And then at the bottom here, I wrote cytokinins, which are the root hormones. This actually flows from the roots and then travels up the plant. The auxins, again, start from the top of the plant and work their way down. There's both auxins and cytokinins throughout the entire plant, but the concentrations are different depending on where you are. More auxins near the top, more cytokinins naturally near the bottom. And depending on how that balance and depending on how you prune it will actually affect the fluctuation of hormones and ultimately the plant growth. I'm sharing this with you because this is kind of the science behind what's happening and that's actually going to create the root formation that we're trying to accomplish. So I'm going to take this off here as it's in the way. What I want to share with you also, if you come in a little closer, you can take a look here that at every node, so this was the node, and at every node there was a fig, and here another leaf, and the node, and there was another fig right here, and here's another node. And what I like about this fig tree is I can also share with you that there's these breathing holes around each of the nodes. If you can take a look at, these, at those little dots that basically go around those nodes. Those dots are actually called lenticles. And they're actually breathing holes that allow the bark to actually breathe. It actually brings air from the outside into the cambium tissues and exchanges gases from the cambium tissues back out. So these lenticles will actually be um, places that are more likely than not to also um, result in root formation. So um, keep that in mind as we actually go through um, preparing our air layering to this Kodota fig variety. So the first step in preparing this is we're going to have to remove some of the bark. We're actually trying to interfere with the flow of the hormones through the plant. And to accomplish this, we're going to remove the bark below one of the nodes. So we have identified this node and this will be actually a little bit too close to this leaf. So I'm actually going to go down a little bit further. We'll identify this node over here. And all of these white dots that actually are growing around the plant, you can actually see right here at the nodes, one white dot, another white dot, another white dot will ultimately form into the root. And what I'm gonna do here with my razor is I'm gonna cut right underneath it about a quarter inch. And I'm basically gonna cut all the way through and around. And you can see here comes the sap. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually cutting around the bark down to the cambium layers. I'm not cutting through the wood. And this sap is carrying waters and sugars, and it's also transporting those hormones, the cytokinins from the bottom and the auxins from the top. And by interfering with this fluctuation, we're gonna cause it to root. I'll explain how in just a minute. So we've just cut here. We're gonna do our second cut. It could be right above the next node. And we'll just wrap it around like so. And then we just gotta create an opening for us to get into. And then we're gonna open the bark like so. And we're gonna, it peels just like it's clothing coming off. It actually is quite loose. Here it is. You can see all that green is the cambium and the living tissues of the plant. And what we're going to do now is we're just going to scar and make sure that all of those vessels that are transporting the waters and the sugars and those hormones up and down the plant are damaged. What's going to happen at the top now are the auxins are going to come flowing down and there's no cytokinins to dilute it on this top part of the plant. And what the auxins do is um, increase root development. So it's going to encourage these nodes to now develop into roots. What we're going to now do is put some rooting hormone around this zone. So we're taking our rooting hormone, our rooting powder, and as you can see here, we just put this rooting hormone on it. So the next step is we got to create now some soil or give it some soil medium to basically um, offer the plant for it to develop its roots. And what we're going to use to accomplish this is the sphagnum moss. And we're just going to put that in some water to absorb and it allows us to actually form it around the plant a lot easier. And while this is happening, I'm gonna prepare the container 
that's going to support the soil. And what we're going to do is just basically take our water bottle. I just took off the lid here. And I'm going with my pruners. We're just going to cut it like so. All the way up. And that's the reason I got my two pruners. Use my heavier pruners to cut the thicker lid. And now I'm using just my regular scissors, my paper scissors, to cut up near the top. And right at this button over here, I'm just going to open that up into a little circle as well. And that'll sh hold right around the tree. So you can see what I've now created. Here's my water bottle. We've split the end that you drink from apart. We've tore all the way up the side. And then we've created a little opening for the branch to actually come through. What we're going to do now here is just wrap this around the plant like so. And then we'll take some of our twine to secure it in place. Again, this tie is only gonna be here temporarily. I never, ever, ever encourage knots to be formed against a tree, but this is only gonna rest here. It typically takes anywhere from as little as two weeks to as much as eight weeks, maybe up to 10 for this process to work. And again, I just want to reiterate, this process can be used on pretty much everything. Um, I've got a ficus tree here to my right, that's my neighbor's. It can work on a ficus tree, it could work on an elm tree, it could work on your, um, pretty much, you name it. Oak trees, just on and on and on. If you see magnolia trees, if there's anything that you see that you like, you can actually create the, the genetic identical clone of it through this method. What we're gonna do next is now take our moss. It's now absorbed the water. We're gonna take some of this. So now we're gonna put the moss inside the container. You can squeeze it just a medium amount. You can allow some water to stay within it. And we're just gonna fill the container like so. And you're just gonna to wanna to make sure you get the moss all around it. You don't wanna pack it too tight and nor too loose. You're gonna be the judge of this part. But you just wanna make sure that it's in contact with that particular node. That's gonna be the key. We're gonna cover the wound that we created and a couple and about a quarter inch to a half an inch above the node. Those nodes are gonna the nodes are gonna form the roots and basically fill in this media of soil. And you can see using this sphagnum moss, it's quite easy to work with. It could work with any other type of soil. So in regards to improvising, if you had to use something else, it could work. But the moss actually is just really easy to work with. That's it. I'm going to spin this around so you can actually see what I've done. You can see the tear over here. The moss is kind of bulging out of the plant. What we're going to now do is just take our string and we're just going to secure it in place so it doesn't move. If it moves while the plant is trying to root, it's going to damage the roots. So we got to make sure that it stays where we want it to be. Tighten that up. And then what we're going to do next is take a little bit of tin foil. And what I'm using the foil first is to basically help the bottom of the container contain the liquid. So we're just wrapping it near the base. And we're just pressing that down. Again, we haven't created an airtight seal, and you'll see why in a minute. And then we're gonna take some more foil, and what we're gonna do with the rest of this is basically trick the plant into thinking that this area is underground. You wanna make it dark. You don't have to use foil, you can use paper, you can use any other thing, but the logic behind it is you're trying to create a dark environment, which is what the roots are used to growing into. And that's the reason we created this shield. And now the last step is I'm taking my little watering can here and I'm gonna add this product over here, which is Super Thrive. And what it is, is it's basically like a vitamin B1 solution. It helps with any transplant shock. It's also got a little bit of nitrogen in it and that'll actually encourage some growth. And we're just gonna put a couple of drops of that in here. And water the top. So we got all of those vitamins, all of this good water going right into the plant, and you can see that the water is passing right through 
and dripping down the plant. There is no water being trapped in this area, and nor should there ever. If it's actually an airtight seal, and I've seen people using saran wrap, and I've seen people using other more airtight methods, and the risk of that is you're causing mold and mildew and disease and rot to actually occur around the plant. By actually allowing the airs to pass through, it actually will encourage a more healthier root development within this area. So you can see that the water is still just dripping down and coming out of the plant. So we're gonna add water to this plant. And most people do it so airtight that they never add water and they just come and revisit it you know, a few weeks or a month later and the roots are there. But the healthier way to do it is to actually allow it to breathe and just water it. Hopefully if you've got the time to visit your plants twice a week, add some water and open the results about four to six weeks from now and you'll be surprised. Let me show you what I've accomplished over here. So here we, here we are now again, my Eureka lemon tree. We're just going to, let me put my scissors away. So we're just gonna unwrap the foil here. First take a look, and you're gonna see more as I continue to um, unwrap it, but take a look at all the roots over here on this side. Take a look at all of that. So this was formed about six weeks ago, and you can see how much root development we've accomplished in that short period of time. Here's the lower foil that was helping to keep the waters in place. We're gonna unwrap this at our table behind me. What we're gonna do here is we're just going to sever the plant that we've created from the parent, which is the lower part. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna follow this leaf. You can see that it's already starting to bud. As we discussed earlier, there's more cytokinin hormones at the lower part. It's encouraging now the next branching to come out. We're just gonna cut about a quarter inch above it and at an angle. And you can see this here is now the pruned end. So over here is um, where we just pruned our air layering um, plant that we've created. And we're now gonna seal this with an organic, Ivy Organic three-in-one tree guard, just add water, a natural tree trunk and branch barrier, protection against damaging sunburn and insects and rodents for use on your roses, fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees and shrubs, and it's a non-toxic, environmentally safe and organic product. We're using color white, but it's also available in brown and green. And I'm just gonna mix it to make sure that all the oils and the um, paint are in contact with one another. And I'm just gonna take my brush and just seal the end as this wound will take anywhere from a year to a couple of years to close. And by sealing it, I've now protected against pathogens, bacteria, viruses, and then the more obvious, termites, wood boring beetles, and so much more. And we've used it down below. This was applied um, when we installed the plant about two years ago. And you can see that it's starting to fade off the plant, but it's still offering the light protection. But once upon a time, there was a lot more sun before it created its canopy to shade the lower trunk from the damaging sunburn. A citrus is particularly susceptible to damage from sun. So here we are now. We're gonna open our surprise. We're gonna take off this tie and take off the lower foil. And then here it is. I'm just gonna open it up here. And you can see how easily we just created a new plant. We're gonna try not to disturb the soil medium around it. And now what we can do is just bring our pruning to a little closer to where the roots are. And now we've created a new plant with plenty of roots. And what we're gonna do now is plant it. And I'm gonna give you a few um, quick planting tips. What I'm most excited about with this plant is it's now a genetically identical cutting to that plant that grew from a seedling here in Los Angeles in 1858, as we explained um, earlier. The Eureka lemon tree is um, of an Italian heritage. Um, so it was actually um, came from some seeds that were apparently brought from Italy, grown here successfully in Los Angeles, and became such a popular lemon in regards to just being a heavy bearing, delicious, um, quality lemon and it's actually made its way into many grocery stores across the world. So this lemon is actually growing on its own rootstock which means this lemon will grow to a standard size being anywhere from 20 to 30 plus feet. We can naturally um, prune it to control its size but otherwise this plant will grow to a very large lemon tree size as it's not grafted so its root is not going to be restricted to allow the plant to reach its maximum height unlike 
the lemon tree that's behind me, which is grafted on a semi-dwarf rootstock, which will keep its root between 8 to as much as 15 feet. Again, this one will grow from at least 20 to upwards of 30 feet, and I'm going to try to find a nice home. And the other great thing I love about this is it's a multi-branched lemon, so we're going to grow it as a bush, and it's just going to be a giant bush, and each branch is going to support a lot of lemons. And all we got to make sure is that the branches don't cross one another, but we'll do a pruning lesson on that um, later. Let's actually pot this real quick. So I'm just going to set this plant here in the shade so the roots are not exposed to the sun. And what we're going to do here is we're going to start off with a pot like so. you got to make sure it's got a hole at the bottom so that the water can pass through. And again, you want to make sure that the plant gets air. It's got to breathe, even at the root level. So what we're going to do first is we're going to put some rocks. I've also got some broken um, clay pot materials that I found around the property. and. I've also got next to me wood chips, and I just want to make this point that you do not want to put wood chips at the bottom as it will rob the soil that we're going to put in here of the nutrients, and it could potentially rot and actually kill the plant. So you want to use something um, that's actually going to help with drainage, and rocks is a great um, option. So we're just going to put that at the bottom of the pot like so. We can even put some of these clay materials in there as well. And what this is going to do is once we water, it's going to force the water to come out and, and get out of the pot so that, again, the roots are not surrounded by water and drowning. So this is going to help with the flow of water. What we're going to do next is I've got a perlite and vermiculite and peat moss mixture, and it's basically one third part of each. So what we're going to do is, and I've got over here a bag of perlite, which is just more of the whiteness, and this actually helps with increasing drainage as well. And what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna add a little more perlite for what's gonna be the bottom mixture of this pot. And the reason is, again, to further encourage water to pass through the soil quickly. And then we're, now we've got equal parts of the vermiculite, perlite, and moss that'll be going into the rest of this. And now we're gonna put in position our lemon. And that will go in here like so. We'll cover the rest up, position that in place, and then I'm also going to take, again, another handful or two of perlite, because I want, again, increased drainage, and that'll actually form not just the bottom two inches, but also the top two inches of this plant. And we're just going to put that around. And we want to make sure that we don't cover the root ball by more than a quarter of an inch. So I'm trying to find the lowest. Here's the moss right there at this point. We wanna make sure that we don't cover it. So I'm gonna probably have to stake it as well to hold it in place as these roots get developed. That's gonna be done. With the wood chips that I brought, we can actually put that around the plant, but keep it away from the stem so it doesn't cause any stem rot. As the wood decays, you don't want it to be decaying the, the, plant, the plant's trunk. So we'll just put these wood chips around it, and again, pull the wood chips away from the plant's trunk. And the wood chips, again, will offer more minerals as well as help retain the water. I'm gonna put the saucer back in place, and now we just gotta water it. And then I'm just gonna put a few drops again of the Super Thrive, which is of another, again, a vitamin B1 with a little of nitrogen in there. And what that's gonna do is help with the transplant shock as obviously we just did a lot to this plant. It's also gonna help encourage root development as well. We're just going to water the plant like so. So the last thing we're going to do now is create a foliar spray. We're going to use the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Tree Guard paint. And we're going to mix that again to make sure we get the oils as well as the paint together. And we're just going to add about a teaspoon or two to our spray bottle. And then shake it and spray it. And what this is going to offer is a sunblock to the plant, as well as it's got the oils to repel any insects from harming the plant while its root system gets established. And if you zoom in a little closer, you can actually see um, the foliar organic white spray that we use to basically keep the plant cool as the plant gets established in its new home. We'll position it now in a place which will get um, light for half the day, and it'll be in the shade for the rest of the day. And that pretty much concludes it. The air layering method for propagating pretty much every single type of tree that you desire.
Well, if you enjoyed this educational lesson brought to you by RV Organics, be sure to give us a thumbs up. And most importantly, share with us your comments, give us your feedback, and share this link with your friends and family. As always, keep growing with Ivory Organics and wishing you all happy gardening.